Hey folks, welcome to the Dark Horse Podcast. I am sitting today with Matthias Desmet, who is a professor of clinical psychology at Ghent University. He also holds a master's degree in statistics. Professor Desmet, welcome to Dark Horse. Uh, thank you, Brett. It's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. Well, I am pretty excited about this conversation. I have been uh, steeped in your work, not for very long, but uh, I have looked carefully at it and I have found a tremendous amount that resonates for me. There is one element that I think, um, I don't know that I would say that I differ with you on it, but there is a way in which when a psychological perspective and an evolutionary perspective um, meet, there is a lot of potential uh, gain to be had if we can figure out how the two stories intersect, but that's not always an easy process. I'm hoping it will happen here. But I think uh, to begin with, it would make sense. You have um, erupted into the public eye for your work on what is called mass formation. Some will have heard it discussed as mass formation psychosis, but I don't think that's the general term. Uh, so what I would like is for you to describe the process of mass formation and what it has to do with certain patterns of history that everybody who watches this will already be familiar with, even if they don't realize that they are in fact patterns. Yes, yes, indeed. I never use the term mass formation psychosis because I think both from an intellectual and an ethical point of view, and even a strategical point of view, it is better to use the term mass formation, which is a more neutral term, less stigmatizing, um, uh, which doesn't enter the domain of individual psychodiagnostics and so on. Uh, so I, I prefer the term mass formation. Excellent. I think that's right. Uh, the one downside to it is that um, it does not immediately call anything to mind for most people. Um, psychosis obviously does, but I agree with you. Psychosis is uh, prejudicial and counterproductive. Our first sponsor for this week's episode is Vivo Barefoot, shoes made for feet. Most shoes are made for someone's idea of what feet should be and be constrained by. Vivos are made by people who know feet and know how to use them. Here at Dark Horse, we love these shoes. They are beyond comfortable. The tactile feedback from the surfaces you are walking on is amazing, and they cause no pain at all because there are no pressure points forcing your feet into odd positions. They're fantastic. Our feet are the product of millions of years of evolution. Humans evolved to walk, move, and run barefoot. But modern shoes that are overly cushioned and strangely shaped have negatively impacted foot function, and are contributing to a health crisis, one in which people move less than they might, in part because their shoes make their feet hurt. Vivo Barefoot shoes are designed wide to provide natural stability, thin to enable you to feel more, and flexible to help you build your natural strength from the ground up. Foot strength increases by 60% in a matter of months just by walking around in them. The number of people wearing Vivo Barefoots is growing. Once people start wearing these shoes, they don't seem to stop. Vivo Barefoot has a great range of footwear for kids and adults, and for every activity except wing walking. From hiking and training to everyday wear, Vivo has got your next pair of shoes. They're a certified B Corp, pioneering regenerative business principles, and their footwear is produced using sustainably sourced natural and recycled materials with the aim to protect the natural world so you can run wild on it. Go to vivobarefoot.com slash darkhorse to get an exclusive offer of 20% off. Additionally, all new customers get a 100-day trial so you can see if you love them as much as we do. That's V-I-V-O-B-A-R-E-F-O-O-T dot com slash darkhorse. Our next sponsor for this episode is Moink. That's Moo plus Oink. Moink. An eighth-generation farmer founded Moink and is working hard to help save the family farm and get its customers access to the highest quality meat on Earth or anywhere else in the known universe. Whereas 97% of the chickens served in the U.S. are dipped in chlorine solution, Moink, a family farm, will never do that. Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and wild-caught Alaskan salmon direct to your door. Moink farmers farm like your grandparents did. And as a result, Moink meat tastes like it should, which is to say, delicious. Unlike the supermarket, Moink gives you total control over the quality and source of your food. You can choose the meat delivered in every box, from ribeyes to chicken breasts to pork chops to salmon fillets and much more. Plus, you can cancel at any time. We love everything about Moink. The fact that the meat is grass-fed and finished on small farms, the lovely publications that come along with it, and of course, the meat itself. 
Shark Tank host Kevin O'Leary called Moink Bacon the best bacon he'd ever tasted. I agree. It's amazing. Keep American farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com slash darkhorse, and listeners of this show will receive free filet mignon for a year. That's one year of the best filet mignon you'll ever taste, but for a limited time. It's spelled moink, M-O-I-N-K, box.com slash darkhorse, moinkbox.com slash darkhorse. This process of mass formation is, is, is a... It's a specific kind of group formation, which has very specific effects at the level of individual mental functioning. For instance, if people are in the grip of a process of mass formation, they tend to become radically blind for everything that goes against the narrative the group believes in. It is as if they don't have any capacity anymore to take a critical distance of what the group believes in. And this holds even for people who are extremely intelligent. And, 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 and highly educated. So that's, that's one of the, of the strangest things of mass formation. Um, even the higher the level of education, it has been observed time and time again, the more vulnerable people become for mass formation, which is quite strange, of course. Um, then a second characteristic, a very important uh, 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 characteristic of mass formation is that as people are in the grip of it, they typically become willing to self-sacrifice. It is as if they are no longer aware of their own individual interests, as if they are willing to sacrifice everything for the sake of the collective interests, and to a very extreme extent. And a third uh, crucial phenomenological characteristic of mass formation is that uh, it, people who are in the grip of it typically become radically intolerant for dissonant voices. And in the end, this goes quite far. In the end, uh, people who are in the grip of mass formation uh, typically start to commit cruelties and atrocities towards the people that do not go along with the masses. And even more specific, they do so as if it is an ethical duty to do so. That's typical for, for, for masses of all times, whether we are talking about the Crusades or the witch hunts or the French Revolution or the emergence of the masses in the Soviet Union or in Nazi Germany, every time you see the same characteristic, after a while, when the mass formation becomes very deep, uh, people typically start to commit cruelties towards those who do not go along with them, and they do so as if, an ethical, as if it is an ethical duty. To give only one example, uh, two months ago, I was talking with this woman of Iran, and this conversation is, conversation is available on the internet, who lived in Iran during the revolution in 1979, which was the beginning of a large scale process of mass formation in Iran. And she described how she had seen with her own eyes how a mother reported her son to the state and how she hung the rope around, around his neck when he was on the scaffold and how she claimed to be a heroine for doing so. That's, 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 that's a process that um, the typical end point of mass formation is that in a strange way, people are willing to commit cruelties towards everyone who doesn't go along with the masses, and they do so as if it is an ethical duty to do so. All right. Uh, so that's, that's, that's purely the phenomenological characteristics of mass formation. But as soon as you, I think that shows how extremely important it is. Well, let's, to, uh, let's pause there for a second. I want you to yes. complete describing the model. I think it's very important that you get the whole thing on the table. But I want to point out that what you've described so far is a series of paradoxes where things that do not appear to make sense become apparent driving forces of important historical processes. And what I hope we will get to is an explanation for why those things are in fact not paradoxical, why they make sense in an evolutionary context, even though they seem utterly absurd to an observer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we will try to, we will try to. At least I can describe the mechanism of mass formation. That's what I did in my book, uh, The Psychology of Totalitarianism, which was recently published. Uh, I, I go into the mechanism, the psychological mechanism, and I'm very curious to your uh, ideas about the biological mechanisms of mass formation. But I go into the psychological mechanisms of, mechanisms of mass formation in order to show actually that these strange, utterly, seemingly utterly absurd characteristics at the phenomenological level can be explained in a psychological way and start to make sense. Um, and maybe, well, it's important to, 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 to stipulate from the beginning that mass formation exists as long as mankind exists. It exists 
uh, as long as mankind exists, but the modern masses um, are not the same as the ancient masses. There are very important differences, very important differences that um, uh, are crucial from a psychological perspective. For instance, the ancient masses were masses that gathered physically. They gathered physically. The individuals that constituted the mass were physically present or were physically together. And the modern masses are what is sometimes called, what well, are sometimes called lonely masses. Modern masses are very often created through the mass media. Modern masses are groups of people that all share the same ideas, that are all in the grip of the same images, that are all in the grip of the same narratives and myths, but that never physically gather, that often live in a rather isolated state. And that is exactly, it is exactly this state of individuals in a lonely mass, what makes them extremely susceptible and extremely vulnerable for all kinds of propaganda. <laughs> that's, 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 it's a perfect state in which you can reach someone with propaganda and take in the grip of propaganda. So that's an, an important thing. And as soon as you start to understand that the phenomenon of mass formation uh, is the basis of what we call totalitarian states, you start to understand how extremely important it is to understand what mass formation is and how it works. And also why it's only the mechanism of mass formation that allows us to explain why totalitarian states emerged for the first time in the 20th century. Before the 20th century, there were classical dictatorships, but there were no totalitarian states. And the difference between a classical dictatorship and a totalitarian state is exactly at a psychological level that the totalitarian state is based on mass formation, on the emergence of a mass or a crowd, which led by certain leaders can seize control of society. While a classical dictatorship is very primitive in its psychological mechanism. In a classical dictatorship, the population is just scared of a small group, of the aggressive potential of a small group, and accepts therefore that the small group imposes its a uh, social contract unilaterally in, a, in a, a, a totalitarian state is based on a completely different psychological uh, process, namely the process of mass formation. Um, is, it, is it okay, Brett, if I, if I just, in a concise way, in a nutshell, uh, describe the process of mass formation, the mechanism? Yep. Uh, before you do, though, I just want to highlight something that you said there about the difference between this process in ancient masses versus modern masses and point out that what you're really describing is the perfect storm that emerged in COVID, where people who were literally confined to their homes more than they had ever been before had intense opinions about people they had never met, would never meet. They had opinions about technologies that they did not understand. Um, in fact, some of the, you know, the few excursions that they made were to source these technologies that had biological implications they couldn't hope to fathom. And so there is something about this modern technological moment reflected, of course, in the conversation that you and I are having. We're having a face-to-face -face conversation thousands of miles apart. Um, and so those kinds of technologies, I would argue, have simply interfaced with this apparently ancient mechanism and they have actually facilitated uh, and amplified its power in a modern context in a way that uh, presumably nobody understood was likely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. So I you were going to describe. I couldn't agree more. The, the, the COVID situation was the perfect situation uh, for people to, 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 to uh, get in the grip of, of this process of mass formation and, and in the grip of, of, of a narrative that, that, was, that was distributed through the, through the mass media. Yes. And, uh, you know, the audience of this podcast will be highly non-random and they will be people overwhelmingly who have over the course of the last couple of years had a large number of interactions where people that they thought they knew appear to believe perfectly bizarre things and to be immune to the detection that those things are not supported by the evidence. It's, it's the most remarkable experience to look someone you know well in the eye and to not be able to understand how they could possibly believe the things that they seem to. 
Um, so anyway, that's that's what we're discussing here. Um, and I think uh, the next thing you were going to do is you were going to describe um, the characteristics uh, that you that lead to to mass formation. Is that right? Yes, 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 yes. That would be good. I think yes, yes. So mass formation, this this very strange kind of group formation, emerges when when large scale mass formation mass formation emerges in society when when uh, the population is in a very specific uh, mental condition. Uh, and the first and most crucial characteristic of this condition is that many people have to feel disconnected from their natural and social environment. That's the most crucial condition. Many people have to feel lonely, disconnected from their natural and social environment. And that, that was something that was very clear just before the corona crisis worldwide. Over 30% of the people worldwide claimed not to have one meaningful relationship and to only connect to other people through the internet. So it's, it was a very strange situation. And the number of people feeling lonely and disconnected was uh, increasing throughout the last few hundred years. And that also explains why throughout the last few hundred years, the mass formation actually became ever stronger. And, and in the end, the masses became so strong uh, that uh, they could seize control of society and create a new kind of, of, of state system, uh, namely the totalitarian state. That was something that was anticipated by Gustave Le Bon in, 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 in 1895 already. He warned the world then that mass formation became increasingly strong. And he said, if we continue like this, the masses will seize control of a society led by certain leaders. And that was exactly what happened about 20 years later. Gustave Le Bon describes this in his book, uh, The Psychology of the Crowd. So, but and the, the most crucial condition, precondition for mass formation uh, to emerge on a large scale in a society is always that uh, uh, there is a number of there is a high number of uh, uh, socially disconnected, uh, isolated people. Disconnected and then, people, and uh, okay, so that's your first characteristic. Are, when you argue that this became especially prominent as a precondition uh, at the beginning of the twentieth century, mm -hmm. is this because people were moving away from their natal homes to work? Is it, is it connected to the Industrial Revolution or, or what caused that extra disconnection? It's definitely connected to the Industrial Revolution, definitely, because uh, it's clear even, you can see in two ways that, it is, that, that the level of loneliness is connected to the level of industrialization and technology use. If you look at this moment in the world, then you will see that the problem of loneliness uh, is almost perfectly correlated to the level of industrialization and technology use in the world. For instance, in Northern America and Western Europe, you will see that the levels of loneliness are much higher than elsewhere. In the, Uni in the, in the, in the United Kingdom, Theresa May appointed a minister of loneliness in 2017, <laughs> just because she realized how and she acknowledged the, the, the number of people who felt lonely. And also in the, in the US, the US surgeon uh, mentioned that there was a loneliness epidemic. So it's generally accepted that the problem is connected to industrialization and technology use. And you also see throughout the ages that as the level of industrialization increases and as the level of technology use increases, we also see this uh, increase uh, in uh, the number of people who feel lonely. Uh, so it's definitely connected to each other. Yes. Okay. All right. So your first characteristic is the disconnectedness and loneliness of people. No. Uh, what's the second? Yes, and, and then fr from the first one follows uh, the second one, which is that many people have to experience a lack of meaning making in life. But the, the, the two are, are, are inevitably connected because as the social bond between people uh, uh, impoverishes or deteriorates, and you will automatically see that people start to be confronted with lack of meaning making. And that's just because people are intrinsically uh, human uh, social animals and, and social beings and that um, they experience meaning every time they see that their existence has an effect on the other. If people notice that their existence has an effect on the other, then they will spontaneously experience uh, uh, meaning and purpose in life. And this, this, if this connection, if the social bond deteriorates, then in the same way, the uh, experiences of meaning making will drop away from existence. And people often don't connect the two to each other, but they are connected. Psychologically, uh, they are very strongly connected at the psychological level. Uh, and yeah. also that, if you, if, you could, if you look at the number of people reporting that they consider their job a bullshit job, 
um, uh, at the end of uh, uh, over somewhere in 2000, 2018, there was this Gallup World Poll, which indicated that 60% of the people worldwide considered their job to be a so-called bullshit job, which is only logical because if people make something, if they produce something with their work, they almost never know the person who will use what they produce, meaning that they never see the effect of their own labor, of their own uh, work on the other. And that's probably one of the reasons why so many people have the experience that their job is a bullshit job. Yeah, this is a really important fact. And of course, before COVID and, and uh, uh, before the woke revolution, many had noticed the collapse of our capacity to make meaning, which I also take to be I mean, there's a lot to discuss and maybe we'll come back to it, but the fact of people largely partnering with other people that they don't grow up with, that they don't know especially well, that our adult lives are interfacing with a lot of people. We may like them, but we don't know them means that our language is impoverished because we don't know the very precise meaning of a term as somebody else uses it. We just sort of have the general, you know, English version in my case. Um, and so that bluntness of every, every term we might wish to use means that the highest quality meaning we could possibly make is pretty low, right? It's just a bunch of dull tools in the shed and you can't make a fine piece of furniture with them. Um, but anyway, I, I, I interrupted you. So you have disconnection, and loneliness is the first characteristic. Uh, a failure of meaning making as the second characteristic. What's third? Yes. Uh, as soon as people start to to be to exist in a disconnected state, confront and confronted uh, with uh, uh, a lack of meaning making in life, something very specific happens at the affective level. Uh, in that conditioned people typically start to experience so-called so free-floating anxiety, frustration, and aggression. That means all kinds of negative effects that are not connected to a mental representation. Or in plain terms, just people feel anxious, frustrated, and aggressive without knowing what they feel anxious, frustrated, and aggressive for. All their anxiety and negative affectivity is disconnected from the environment and from the mental representations. And that is an extremely aversive mental state because if you feel, for instance, anxious and you don't know what you feel anxious for, you will typically feel completely out of control just because you cannot protect yourself from something you don't know. And in the same way, if you feel a lot of frustration and aggression, but you don't know what you feel frustrated and aggressive for, you, there is no way you can direct your frustration and aggression at something in the outer world. So it remains in yourself. And that, that it is this condition, this state of disconnectedness, this state of lack of meaning making, this all this free-floating negative affectivity, um, uh, that is the, the in, if, a, if a population is in this mental condition, then it's ready. It's, pre, it's ready for, for large-scale mass formation. And something, yeah. Well, uh, so free-floating anxiety, and I know uh, from reading your work, that what you mean is that it doesn't, it's not about something concrete. And you, you point out here that people have a general sense of foreboding and that that um, is particularly uh, frustrating, let's say, because it doesn't suggest a proper course of action, right? No, exactly. It's, so it's, and usually, usually this leads to the development of individual psychological symptoms like a phobia or uh, one or another obsessional, obsessional behavior uh, is typically one way in which all this free-floating anxiety can be connected symptomatically to a certain representation. And this allows a subject to have a minimal level of control over its anxiety. Because when you feel anxious, but you have no idea what you feel anxious for, you're completely out of control. But if you can symptomatically connect your anxiety to, for instance, a spider or a snake, then you, had, you, you made a huge progress because in this way, you only have to avoid the snakes and the spiders in order to have a minimal control over your anxiety. So 
Very often this state leads to individual symptoms, but sometimes when many people in the population or in this state, it leads to a mass formation. A mass formation, which is exactly the same as an individual symptom, but at the collective level. Because what, what's, what happens in a mass formation is the following. When many people are in this state, with a lot of free-floating anxiety, for instance, if at that moment, a narrative is distributed through the mass media, indicating an object of anxiety, and at the same time, providing a strategy to deal with this object of anxiety, then all this free-floating anxiety might connect to the object of anxiety, and there might be a huge willingness in the population to participate in a strategy to deal with the object of anxiety, even if it is utterly absurd. Because most people even realize that their individual symptoms and their collective behavior is absurd, but it won't take away that they will continue to go along with the narrative as if it is true. And that's what happens in a mass formation. All this free-floating anxiety connects to this object of anxiety. There is this willingness to participate in a strategy to deal with the object of anxiety, no matter how uh, absurd it is. And in this way, people experience like a first important psychological process or advantage. Um, they will have the feeling that they now can control their anxiety a little bit and they also anticipate the moment when they can direct all this frustration and aggression at the object of anxiety or at the people that do not want to go along with a strategy to deal with the object of anxiety. So that's the first step in every major mass formation in history, every large scale mass formation as the first step is the, the, the object of anxiety can be the Jews or the witches or the Muslims or no matter what. The dirty unvaccinated. The dirty unvaccinated, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, that one, that one it just feels very personal to me because I, I see it in people's eyes. Um, yes. So anyway, it's a very, very scary phenomenon to, to witness. All right, we've got uh, disconnectedness and loneliness, meaning failure, free-floating anxiety, all of these are preconditions, and then the fourth. Yes, yes. Well, the, 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 the fourth condition is actually the free-floating frustration. And I usually split them in two. Uh, the free-floating anxiety is the third condition, and the free-floating frustration and aggression is the fourth condition. Yes, and then it, because you should distinguish them from each other, actually, because some people, for some people, the anxiety is the most important factor. For other people, the frustration and aggression is the most important factor. But no matter what, it leads to this first important step in the process of mass formation, meaning the coupling or the, 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 the connection between a certain mental representation of an, of an object of anxiety that is presented through the mass media, and then uh, the participation in the strategy to deal with the object of anxiety, for instance, the lockdowns to deal with the virus. That's the first step in the process of mass formation. But there is a second step, which is even more important. And it is that because many people participate at the, at the same time in the strategy to deal with the object of anxiety, people have the feeling of fighting a collective heroic battle with the object of anxiety. And that makes them feel connected again. It seems to create this new social bond, meaning that in this way, it seems as if the mass formation eliminates the root cause of the problems, namely this lack of connection, this disconnectedness between the human being and its environment. But <laughs> that's the point. <laughs> the, you, you could say, well, what's the problem? What's the problem? F people feel disconnected and now they feel connected again. They, have, they, are, they, feel, they feel reunited. But the problem is that the, the process of mass formation is very, is, leads to a very specific social bond. The mass, a mass or a crowd is a group that is not formed because individuals connect to each other. A mass is a group that is formed because each individual separately connects to a collective ideal or to the collective, meaning that this solidarity in the masses, which is so typical for the masses, as soon as a mass forms, the masses will typically talk about solidarity and citizenship. But this solidarity is never a solidarity between individuals. It's a solidarity of every individual separately towards the collective and even more the longer the mass formation exists, the more the social bonds between the individuals will be destroyed and replaced by a very strong social bond, a very strong solidarity 
of every individual separately with the collective. And that is what explains why, for instance, in Iran, a mother in the end reports her son, someone with whom she used to have a very strong individual bond, to the state for the sake of the collective. <laughs> that, that also explains why, for instance, in the corona crisis, everybody was full of solidarity and talking about solidarity. And at the same time, strangely enough, people accepted that if someone got an accident on the street, we were not no longer allowed to help that person. Or if we were all talk of everybody was talking about solidarity with the elderly. And at the same time, they accepted, strangely enough, that if their father and mother were dying at home, they were no longer allowed to visit them. So that's the strange destructive mechanism of mass formation, that it sucks all the energy away from the bonds between the people and injects all the energy in the bonds between the individual and the collective, leading in the end always to a radically paranoid atmosphere in which everyone snitches each other and, and in which there are in the end no relationships anymore between individuals and individuals are all completely isolated from each other. Okay, so this leads, and I will confess up front, there's so much to be said about how, the, you know, if you take the picture that you've just painted and you stand and you look through the evolutionary lens at it, I think it, a lot of things resolve and then it raises different questions. I don't know how to present that picture in a short period of time. It's, it's going to take a bunch of hashing out. But one thing that is true is that some of what you have described is the pathological version of a process that clearly has a highly functional and desirable version. And um, some will find this off-putting, but a religious community is obviously highly effective at uh, getting through what I would call bottlenecks, um, at uh, resisting uh, confrontation with other groups, at uh, you know uh, resisting the the fashions and whims of a society. Those religious communities have the structure you're describing, right? Where you know. Person A and person B have a bond that comes from the fact that they both feel they have a personal relationship with someone who died 2000 years ago and whose origin story conflicts with uh, what we understand of biology, right? That's an interesting fact, but it is an also undeniable fact that two people who do share a belief in that story can find a kinship very quickly, just simply upon knowledge that they have subscribed to the same book, right? Um, so I, I have argued many times that religions, longstanding ones, are evolutionarily adaptive, that they are adaptive in spite of being literally false, that their purpose is what I call metaphorical truth, Metaphorical truths are truths that are functional. That is to say, even though they're not literally right, if you behave as if they are right, it uh, benefits you evolutionarily. And so the question then is, what do we make of mass formation? If mass formation is a variation on a theme that is adaptive, is mass formation adaptive? In which way? And so this leads us to the paradoxes that you point out? Why, why are intelligent people equally, if not more, vulnerable to participating in mass formation, right? That's a, a good question. You haven't said it yet, but I know from reading and listening to your work that you believe that these totalitarian regimes that arise out of mass formation always fail. I also believe they always fail. Um, the question is, does that mean that this pattern is like a tumor which kills its host and it has no evolutionary meaning? Or is this something more than a tumor? And the fact that the totalitarian system fails does not mean that this is an evolutionary paradox, but you have to stand somewhere else to see it. I don't know how clear those questions are, but um, what do you hear so far? They are clear, but they are very, very difficult. <laughs> and, yes. Maybe and maybe not. Yes, because the masses, 
There are, there are different types of masses. Um, and indeed, I do believe that uh, the modern masses uh, are always self-destructive. And, and, and together with me, I think that almost every a scholar who studied the modern masses throughout the last 200 years concluded in the same vein. They all concluded in one way or another, the masses are only capable of destruction. And as soon as they destroyed everything around them, everything that, that, that doesn't belong to, to them, they start to destroy themselves. Uh, we've, you, you, could, you could never see this more clearly than in the Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union, uh, which was the, the, the most totalitarian system that has ever existed, much more totalitarian, or, or it was much further in the process of totalitarization and mass formation than Nazi Germany, for instance. Uh, and in the Soviet Union, you could see that first, uh, the masses led by Stalin started to eliminate everyone who didn't belong to them or who could not belong to them. For instance, the aristocracy, the small farmers, the large farmers, then the goldsmiths, the Jews, and so on. They were all considered incapable of, um, of uh, giving up their private property and hence they could never become good communists and they had to be destroyed. But after that, after everyone was eliminated, uh, that, was, that couldn't join the masses according to the masses themselves, they just started to eliminate the one group after the other without any logic in it. Nobody understood anymore why suddenly this group had to be destroyed, destroyed or, had to, or had to be deported to the gulags. Nobody understood it anymore. So that's the blind, irrational destructiveness that is typical for the masses and that in the end leads to the fact that, to use the words of Hannah Arendt, the masses in the end typically become a monster that devours its own children. So I... Yeah. The, the problem is... The monster devours its own children. I totally agree with this. And I'm a, a big fan of Hannah Arendt. The problem is that the people who constituted the mass continue. And so evolutionarily speaking, the fact that the mass does not persist does not mean that the mass was counterproductive to the evolutionary, I'm going to use the term loosely, objective. And mm -hmm. this is what I... Uh, what I hope we can wrestle out of this is that there are um, there are two processes in human beings that are hereditary. One of them is genetic and the other is cultural. There are more, but those are the two biggies, a dual inheritance system. And the problem is the genes are the driver from the point of view of the objective of being a creature, including a human. But in humans, the much more interesting part is the software level, right? Mm. And that software level can believe different things at different times. But in some sense, if you were to go back through the history of belief of your own lineage mm. and you were to trace it back, uh, you know, obviously this becomes impossible before the invention of writing. But let's say you could go back a million years into your own lineage and look at all of the things that your ancestors believed. None of them were a failure. They were mostly wrong, literally, but they did get you here. And so mm -hmm. that's the question is mass formation to me um, looks like an adaptive pattern. And it is confusing to us because the content of it is so upside down that we think this just has to be madness, which is in fact why people uh, put the term psychosis on, right? Mm -hmm. This appears to be a madness. But the problem is a true psychosis is a dysfunction, mm -hmm. right? It is a failure to understand the world. And while the individual wrapped up in the mass fails to understand the world, to be certain, they may well be in the better position to get to the next chapter than the person who says, hey, wait a minute, what are you talking about, right? Mm. And that is, um, I think, the most disturbing thing about this is that the evolutionary story does not offer us comfort just because the mass fails, right? Mm. The mass doesn't really fail. That's not what happens. Um, mm. And um, just a couple more things. In fact, there's no reason that you would necessarily know, but do you know why I ended up in the public eye or how that happened? Do, do you know the evergreen story? Uh, yes, 
I think I know it. What okay. happened? Can, can, but, but, but please. Well, I'm not going to, I won't say terribly much, except that uh, my wife and I were yes. extremely popular professors at a small, very liberal college. And we had a very uh, devoted and wonderful community of students uh, mm -hmm. that we taught evolution. Mm -hmm. And as the woke revolution took over the college, um, I initially ended up in a confrontation with my faculty colleagues. And that confrontation with my faculty colleagues resulted in a group of students that I had literally never met uh, arriving at my classroom and demanding that I be fired for racism. Now, I'm no racist. I'm quite the opposite. Um, but it didn't matter to them. It was quite clearly a little, a little mass. But here's the reason I raise it. Two days before that happened, I put a model on the board. And the model, this was something that I was generating in my own head as I was watching myself turned into the witch in preparation for a witch hunt by my colleagues. And so I was hashing this out with my students and trying to explain to them what I thought was unfolding. And I wrote this model on the board that every witch hunt has four groups in it, right? One group is the tiny number of people who will initiate a witch hunt. Then there's a small but substantial group who will go along with a witch hunt, right? Then there's a large number of people who will say nothing. And then there is a small number of people who resist and those are the witches. Now, mm -hmm. as I was going through your book with my wife, Heather Hying last night, I found you have that model. You have it divided in three, but it's the yes. same model and it has the same punchline, right? Mm -hmm. The punchline mm -hmm. is your source of witches is the resistors to the mass formation. Now, yes. when I wrote that on the board, I didn't know anybody else had a model like that. I didn't know what mass formation was, but the point is in facing one, it became apparent that this was its inherent structure, right? Mm -hmm. Now I faced a little tiny mass, right? Inside my college, a few hundred people were highly animated by a nonsense story that our college was being taken over by white supremacy, right? Which mm -hmm. couldn't have been farther from the truth. Uh, uh, uh. So anyway, I got to see a little miniature version of it. I mean, I, I was literally... Um, hunted on this campus. They were looking for me. I was, I was their, the witch in their eyes, which was a completely bizarre experience. I heard the story before. I heard the story before. Yes, yes, yes. It must have been a terrible experience. And indeed, it's like an experience yeah, of, of a mass formation, a small scale mass formation. Well, a terrible yes. experience. On the other hand, how lucky was I to get to experience it at that scale before mm -hmm. COVID, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Having seen that up close, Mm -hmm. I knew it was like a training camp for how you look mm -hmm. at such a, a bizarre phenomenon and grapple with its meaning. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I don't need, we don't need to get lost in that story. My point was the, the model that came out. Of it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can I respond to your question? Please, please. So uh, in my opinion, I do believe that mass formation in many respects should be considered a state of madness. And I know that I just said that I don't use the term psychosis. Yep. But if you mean with madness, a process in which an individual participates in something that will lead, that might lead to his own destruction, then you're maybe, then I, then I would say that it is a kind of madness. And, and I think it is even important to consider it like that because I think that whether you go along with the masses or whether you defy the masses, in both scenarios, you might very well become the victim of the masses. And, you know, Stalin, Stalin for instance, started to eliminate, he eliminated in the end 60% of the, of, of the members of his own communist party without them having the possibility to prevent them from being eliminated. Because it was almost at random that he picked them and that he, he condemned them to death. And in the same way, I, I, don't, I think that that is exactly what, what is so important to realize, that you never have to try to destroy the masses. In the end, they will always just exhaust themselves, potentially destroy themselves. But what you should focus on 
is preventing that they destroy you. And that's if you if you if you look at the psychological from the, from a psychological perspective, if you look at the mechanism, then you soon then you can see that the most crucial thing, I always repeat that, that's the most important message I can bring at this moment, is that uh, the better you understand the psychological mechanism of mass formation, the more you understand that it is just crucial that the dissonant voices continue to speak out. And why? Because by continue to, continuing to speak out, you exactly prevent that the madness of the masses and their leaders becomes complete and that the masses end up in the state in which they become so fanatically convinced that everyone who goes against them is actually inhumane, lacks solidarity, lacks citizenship, is irrational, and so on, and consequently should be destroyed uh, uh, as, as a, uh, exactly because he is so inhumane. So that this, I think, the entire process for me shows that we are dealing with a process which leads people to a complete blindness a complete self-destructiveness and a complete absurdity in which you should always consider as a kind of a state in which people, uh, in which the, the mental capacities of people uh, are very limited. Um, I think that many people try to explain mass formation from the perspective of uh, that uh, just follow the money and you will understand why they do it or just, uh, just realize that they are that, that there are power hungry individuals who, who, who want to be in charge of everything. I agree with Hannah Arendt that that is not right. Um, the, typical, the typical characteristics of totalitarian leaders is not that they are after the money or not that they want more and more power. The typical characteristic of a totalitarian leader is his radical ideological blindness. The radical ideological blindness which pushes him to impose his ideology to the collective and to society, no matter what the cost is, even if it means that he will be killed himself, that he will lose everything, the typical totalitarian leader will typically continue uh, uh, trying to impose his ideology to society. And then at the lower levels, at the lower levels of a totalitarian state, you find psychopaths, perverts, uh, people who are after the money, Hung, uh, people who want power and so on. But the top level is characterized by ideological blindness, I think. Okay. Uh, here is the crux of our disagreement. And uh, let me just say, uh, I hope the better argument wins, right? If it's your argument, that will in one way be comforting to me and um, I'm happy to go there. But I am going to try to persuade you that what is madness at the individual level is not madness at the collective level and that evolutionarily speaking that collective level matters more which is why we see the pattern and mm -hmm. um there are first i want to go back to something you said and i want to pressure test it a little bit mm -hmm. so you said that the indicator, tell me if I've got your meaning wrong here, I'm paraphrasing you, but you said that the indicator that this was madness was that people were willing to engage in behaviors that put them in danger of destruction. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that effectively right? Yes. Okay. But if we take that same logic, if I say, well, you know, is a, is a, a player of American football are they engaged in madness? Because they are taking substantial risks of harms to their cognitive capacity, to their you know, ability to, to move around in the world. They might even uh, sustain a very serious injury, a crippling one. Um, That's a good question, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I would, I'll just fast forward. Obviously, they're not crazy. We can explain their behavior from the point of view of the rewards that they get outweigh the risks that they take, or at least in their mind, it seems likely that they do. Mm. All right, is that fair? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, what about a soldier who goes into battle, right? Uh -huh. Knows that they may not come back, right? Uh -huh. This is a person engaged in a very dangerous behavior, mm. yet, mm. you know, obviously in wartime, um, you can be shot for deserting uh, mm. in peacetime or something like peacetime, the rewards that are offered to your family 
make it sensible. We can mm. say the same. We can say something similar in the even more radical case of a kamikaze pilot or mm. uh, a suicide bomber, that there is an analysis whereby, I mean, if we just take the trivial version, if is it worth taking a substantial risk or maybe even volunteering for a suicidal mission if it puts your family at sufficient advantage? Let's say that your family was very jeopardized mm. and you engage in some behavior and you're gone, but the position of your children is so much better than it would have been that we, the rationality is apparent. It's brutal, mm. right? We may not like that it's there, but it it's comprehensible, mm. right? So are you with me so far? Yeah, yes, I am. I am definitely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I, I have one other piece of my history that I want to introduce here. Mm. When I was an undergraduate, mm -hmm. uh, I was working with a, one of the great 20th century evolutionary biologists, a guy named Bob Trivers. And I wrote a paper, um, the final paper um, that I wrote in his class was on the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of my paper was to look into the claim that Hitler was a madman. This was something I heard very often as a young person growing up far closer to World War II than I realized at the time. I mean, I obviously knew how many years it was, but it seemed a long time ago. And now, obviously, we're more than twice as far out. Um, the upshot of that paper was that Hitler was a monster, as everyone knows. And I believe that as strongly as anyone, maybe more strongly. But what he did was not evolutionarily irrational. From the mm -hmm. point of view of his gene pool, it may very well have been rational. And this, when I raise this point, it always puts me in an awkward position um, with people because they hear some kind of defense of, of it in there. And I mean the opposite. What I mean is if you're going to prevent this, you have to understand why it happens. And mm -hmm. so in any case, my point here is, I've been interested in the question of why this takes place for a very long time. Until I ran into your work, I didn't know that there was this body of thought that apparently goes back to before the beginning of the 20th century on mass formation. Mm -hmm. And so I've been looking at it from an evolutionary perspective almost uh, strictly. Mm -hmm. But these two things collide, right? Mm -hmm. They're, you know, it's, it's a question of consilience, I think. Consilience, meaning when you, you happen onto the same story from different disciplines and, you know, there's a way to reconcile them and suddenly you have a much more complete picture because, you know, what, what you're describing is um, a process of individual psychology in which an individual appears to be utterly mad because they're saying things that cannot be squared with reality and they appear to be completely committed to them, even though they are putting themselves in great danger by subscribing. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in psychology, you can see, well, OK, but there's a psychology is an individual phenomenon, but there is a group manifestation. There is something about group psychology that is also very real, even though we can't put it in an FRI, fMRI machine and scan it. Right. But it's there. It mm -hmm. clearly is a fact. And then what I'm saying is from an evolutionary perspective, we have the same dichotomy. We have the individual and their fitness. And what mm -hmm. we fail to do well is understand the lineage and mm -hmm. its fitness. And I believe that the solution to the puzzle that you're pointing to, the madness of these immense numbers of people, mm -hmm. is actually a diabolical rationality. And um, that, you know, I'm sure you and I are completely aligned in being terrified by this process. And the question is, is it worth discovering the nature of lineage psychology, discovering that uh, Hannah Arendt's correct belief that these ideologies destroy themselves isn't really comforting if this is the mechanism a lineage uses to get through a historical bottleneck. Mm -hmm. Is that making sense? I think so, yes. But I, I, I'm interested in, in learning more about this diabolic rationality of the masses. Can you, can you 
Yes. By the way, is it, is it rational? Because I still don't understand in what way you consider it rational. Well, you mean first rational of all, from the point of view of the supra organism, this larger organism that the masses. Um, rational. So I must tell you, uh, you will be well aware of the naturalistic fallacy. Right. If I describe that something is a product of evolution, I'm not defending it. And in fact, although humanity's best characteristics are all products of evolution, so are all of our worst characteristics. And I think it is our obligation to uh, augment and amplify the honorable characteristics and to banish the, mm -hmm. the, the evil ones. But I don't want to pretend that they're not comprehensible. They're mm -hmm. quite comprehensible. Yes. And so, you know, the point is, look, let's say that uh, Hitler had succeeded, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say that he had exterminated the Jews and then maybe he branched out and, uh, you know, he had left uh, the continent of Europe Aryan, maybe left the world Aryan, right? Mm -hmm. From the point of view of the genes in his genome, that mm -hmm. would have been a massive win. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 5,000 years after it had happened, he might have been largely, you know, forgotten, right? The average person might have the same relationship with Hitler that, you know, that I have with Caligula, right? I can barely explain who that is. Mm -hmm. um, and so the point is the genes are not um, overly concerned about what the people who have those genes are saying or thinking at any moment. The question is, how do I get into the future? And mm -hmm. one way to get into the future is to eliminate people who share fewer of those genes and to promote people who have more of them. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, if Hitler had gone after people who parted their hair on the left versus the right, that would be a paradox. But mm -hmm. because what he did is he went after people who would, if they were eliminated, be replaced by people who were more closely related to him. Mm -hmm. This is a genetically a comprehensible strategy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Um, it is, in fact, highly effective. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I don't want us to get lost in the fact that um, Hitler was dead wrong about the genetic superiority of the people that he was advancing. Um, mm -hmm. But genes don't care about this. Genes... Oh. Genes want their particular spellings to get into the future, even if the gene, you know, if we're talking about two genes for a respiratory enzyme, and mm -hmm. one of those genes is 50% more efficient, mm -hmm. the one that's less efficient still wants to get into the future and destroy its competitor. Mm -hmm. And I, I use want very loosely. Obviously, they don't really want anything, but they behave as if they want these things. And mm -hmm. both versions of the gene want to get into the future. They're not really interested in finding out which gene is more effective. They don't care. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I, can I respond to that? Please. Yes. You know, in my two-cent word opinion, you now think that... You, you imagine a Hitler who acts and thinks in a rational way and who indeed starts a program of protecting genes and so on and so on, and who succeeds in, 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 in implementing this rational program. But the, pro the problem is, I think, that uh, this process of mass formation seems rational sometimes, but it isn't. In this respect, that, for instance, Hitler started eliminating uh, the gypsies, the Jews, the, the, then he wanted to eliminate the Polish people, the Lithuanians, uh, all the people with, uh, with uh, limitations in, in, in Germany, and also all the people with heart problems, lung problems were on his list. All the Germans with heart problems, lung problems. And I think that history has shown us that if this, if this process continues, it starts to become completely irrational, wait, also from the perspective of the ideology of the one who is leading the masses, and exactly because the real function of this process of mass formation is not ultimately, is not so much imposing a rational ideology to the world. The real function of this process is to handle and to control anxiety, frustration, and aggression. And this process continues. There is something in the process of mass formation which makes that it can never stop 
because first the masses, as the masses emerge, they 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 have one object of anxiety that is indicated in a narrative, and they try to eliminate to destroy this object of anxiety. But as they have, as soon as they succeed in destroying this object of anxiety, what they will find out is that they need a new object of anxiety simply because the masses themselves don't want to wake up because they would be confronted again with all this disconnectedness and all this frustration, aggression, anxiety. So the masses want the mass formation to continue. The leaders know that the mass formation must continue because otherwise they will be killed by the masses themselves. If the masses wake up, they will typically destroy their leaders. So both the masses and the leaders know that the phenomenon of mass formation should not stop Meaning that after they have destroyed the first object of anxiety, they have to deal. They have to find a second object of anxiety which can be destroyed, and then a third, a fourth, a fifth, and so on. So, and now we see that in the end, this process of mass formation, in my opinion, uh, is not so much. While it seems as if the masses and their leaders and the totalitarian state try to impose a rational ideology, for instance, the selection of the optimal genes to the population, what really drives them is the handling, the, the, is, is their own anxiety and their own, their own uh, um, problems at the level of disconnectedness, meaning that, and their attempt to deal with their anxiety and their attempt to create a new connection is always a symptomatic one, and in the end, always fails, just because the masses do not create new connection between individuals, they, as I just expe as I explained uh, 10 minutes ago or something. They, they, they create a connection between, between the individual and the collective, meaning that, in the end, I think that mass formation is always a kind of a symptom. It's a symptom that, in which, which develops in an organism, for instance, in a society, in which, in the initial stage seems to solve a problem, but which in the end becomes fatal and destructive for the organism that develops a symptom. So I think you can perfectly compare it to a tumor. And, and in this respect, I think that a gene, the, 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 the selection of genes could be fruitful and selective if it happened outside a phenomenon of mass formation in a truly enlightened mind. <laughs> there, there it could be something rational that leads to good results. But the problem is that as soon as it becomes the, the ideology of a mass, it will, I think, always be counterproductive and in the end lead to the destruction of uh, also the masses themselves. So that's my first initial reaction to, to your... Uh, yeah, I know, I know, uh, I know why we're... Um tripping over this stage of of interaction it has to do remember at the beginning of the conversation i said that uh when people who don't really know each other very well meet they have only the blunt version of language mm -hmm. the problem is the word rational mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. i don't mean what i think almost everyone will take from that term here. And I just realized what the distinction is, right? Let's say that hypothetically, um, we have some friend mm -hmm. and they've fallen madly in love. In fact, the term madly in love, right? Mm -hmm. This person becomes hard to interact with. They are very difficult. You, you know, the person, the object of their, uh, of their love is something that they can't be objective about in the slightest, mm -hmm. right? Um, it would be fair to say that this is a state of madness, mm. right? It is inconsistent with reality, right? The chances that they've actually fallen in love with somebody who's that perfect are zero. And yet, even though they rationally know that they still feel it, right? Mm -hmm. um, is it irrational to fall in love? To be honest? Yeah. I think it is. Um, oh, then you're not doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> by, by, which, by which I don't mean, I think I, I, I agree with Freud who said, if you don't lose your rationality from time to time, it means you have uh, not so much to lose. I believe we should 
be rational all from time to time. Oh, okay, okay. No, but, this is perfect. But, we're now yeah. we're now yeah. finding out what, how you use this term, yeah. right? Yeah. You, yeah. Your use of this term uh, runs into what I would say is a failure mode at the point we encounter somebody who's madly in love, right? Because yeah. I would say, look, there is a reason that you are wired to lose your cognitive rationality and, yeah, I see what you mean. Yes. and it has everything to do with your long-term well-being right mm -hmm. and your long-term well-being isn't even your long-term well-being it is directly involved in your lineage's well-being going forward right so that that irrationality serves an evolutionary purpose very clearly yes i see but you need irrationality to transcend yourself from time to time uh yeah yes but i do uh, too oh, i mean i, I use that you know, uh, and in fact, I know that you and I are going to agree here because uh, one of the things that caught my attention and Heather's attention in your work is your uh, deep understanding of the problem of uh, reductionism, the hazard mm -hmm. of reductionism to clear thought, right? And so what does it mean not to fall into that trap? What it means is that you have little mechanisms for allowing yourself not to be able to answer what connects A and B and say, well, I'm sure there's something there and it mm -hmm. could look like X. Maybe I'll come up with something that I don't really think does connect them, but is in principle a proof that something could, right? Mm -hmm. And then with that spackle covering that hole, I can go and build a model. And it doesn't mean I think it is or it isn't true, but the point is the, a, a scientist who thinks in a, uh, an emergent way and works on things complex enough that they don't understand every element has to allow themselves leeway in places, right? You have to not hold yourself to a perfectly high standard for every step in the thing that you're trying to understand, or you'll be paralyzed. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that, that is a kind of irrationality that mm -hmm. is essential to high quality work. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know if you're eager to respond, in which case I don't want to stop you, but. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. I'm listening. So I just want to, I want to now connect the, the picture that we've got, right? We now understand that we're using rationality in specialized ways, right? Mm -hmm. I'm arguing that sometimes selection has us do something that if we zoom in too close is perfectly irrational, right? We have people saying perfectly irrational things in a mass formation. Mm -hmm. Is the behavior of the mass rational from the point of view of a lineage getting into the future? That's mm -hmm. the question. And I'm perfectly happy to swap out the term rational for some other term, but mm -hmm. successful, adaptive, mm -hmm. right? And therefore that the belief system, the, the uh, irrational belief system doesn't need to persist in order for the strategy to be a success. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. You, maybe it could be considered rational from this point of view. Maybe. Uh, but I believe um, Nietzsche, for instance, Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, would probably say that mass formation is rational from in this, in this, in this respect, that, 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 that helps the weaker people uh, to survive because they connect to each other in a mass and they, 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 they start to belong to a, to a supra-organism. Uh, or I, I remember certain... Uh, quotes of Nietzsche who go in that direction. But anyway, it could be considered rational, I think, from this point of view. But is, I also think there could be a different type of rationality in the process of mass formation, I think. And allow me to, 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 to tell me Please. Um, that, there, that or to describe a, another perspective that could make us see that the process of mass formation maybe has some rationality in it. You know, when a mass formation forms, when a mass emerges in a society, there is always a group who doesn't go along with the masses. And this group is typically put under a huge pressure. And under these circumstances, this group can go in two directions. It can form a mass itself. And in this way, we have a small mass and a large mass who polarize. And very often in that case, the small mass is destroyed just because there are two groups functioning to the same, according to the same destructive principles. And very often, the small group is destroyed. Not always, but very often. But then this group has also another option. If this group decides to do something very specific, 
he will not only survive, but he will go through an extremely fast process of mental evolution. And it is the following, that this group, if this group decides to continue to speak out and to stick to the principles of humanity itself, while the masses typically dehumanize, then this group, at a very fast pace, in a very short period of time, will become more and more aware of these principles of humanity and will become stronger and stronger, uh, both at the mental and at the physical level. That, is perfectly, that was perfectly described by Solzhenitsyn, uh, among many other people, who, who described how in the gulags, um, most prisoners became radically beast-like. They started to behave in a beastly manner and they started to crush each, each other's skulls just to steal each other's food and, and, and each other's clothes and, and uh, they became even worse for each other than, than the guards were ready for them and so on. But Solzhenitsyn said, for one reason or another, there was also a small group of, group of prisoners who, did, who went in exactly the opposite direction. In this pool of darkness, they chose to represent a little bit of light and they, they remained loyal to the principles of humanity, to certain, to certain ethical standards. And Solzhenitsyn observed something very specific in this small group. Some of them died, but many of them became stronger and stronger and stronger at the mental level and at the physical level. And Solzhenitsyn said like, that for him, he, he won the Nobel Prize for this wonderful book, uh, The Gulag Archipelago, where he described uh, this, among other things. And he described how he knew prisoners who entered the gulags uh, sickly and because they were so loyal to their ethical principles, they became stronger and stronger at the physical level. And in the end, they survived the gulags. And um, so that if you, if you look at mass formation and the totalitarianism from a little bit of distance, then you see a very typical process, which could be rational in this respect, that it is nature that puts a lot of pressure, that that makes that as a large group, a large organism, puts a lot of pressure on a small group and pushes it in a direction and on a pathway where it would never go without the pressure of the masses of the large group. And in which, in this way, nature creates like a mechanism that gives birth to a new and more clear awareness of what it means to be human uh, and and in which it produces like a kind of awareness in human beings and the kind of strength that would not exist without this dehumanizing organism that the masses is. We could also look at it like that. Then it also makes sense. Then it is also rational, but from a completely different perspective. Well, first of all, I cannot help but see in what you've just described exactly the experience that happened during the pandemic, because... Uh, I, I'm, I will guess that you've had the same experience that I have had where uh, the pandemic has strained relationships that felt extremely solid beforehand, but it has also mm -hmm. forged a tremendous number of very high quality connections with people who have extraordinary capacities and who amplify each other's humanity. That's been the silver lining for, I think, many of us is that we, we have... Um, met so many high quality, courageous, insightful people, yourself among them, uh, in my case. Thank you. Um, and so that's a very powerful force. I hear you saying that maybe the, uh, the troubling authoritarian mass, that it could be rational in the sense that it creates this reaction that's very high quality. I think they are both rational. And, you know, uh, one of the things that's hard to see evolutionarily is we tend to think, well, what is the best strategy? And the point is, well, you've got strategies and counter strategies. And, uh, I, you know, I have written on my, my notes here, mass versus anti-mass, because there is something about the process of the people who uh, do appear to have resisted the madness and to have uh, shown such strength of character that has some of the same characteristics. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we have scratched our itch in a very different way. Um, mm -hmm. But nonetheless, the camaraderie it, in your description, it is the terror of loneliness and the inability to interpret the world 
that drives people to scratch that itch by signing on to a nonsense story that gives the promise of some kind of salvation. And that thing created a world in which some of us became obsessed with making sense from actual evidence, difficult as that is, and it created a camaraderie of a different kind. So basically the point is everybody's looking for camaraderie and there are a couple different paths. One of them is easy and very dangerous. The other is, uh, well, dangerous to the individual at an extraordinary level, um, mm -hmm. but nonetheless does bring you in the same kind of contact. And it is very uh, reassuring to discover that there are others, for example. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Oh, go ahead. No, I, still, I think that there is, or we should watch out that we do not become a, a real mess just because um, there is, a, I think, the, 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 the most important distinction between uh, sound and fruitful group formation and a mass formation is that in a group, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a good group formation, uh, there is on the one hand, a certain bond between the, in, between the individual and the collective, but also the bonds between individuals are strong. And there is a real solidarity between the individuals as well. And I think that I also, I, I, I discovered many new friendships during, during the crisis. And I, in my experience, it existed of really strong bonds between the individuals. I don't think that I started to form a mass with other people. Uh, like, look, when, he, when he, you and me are talking now, we can have a different opinion. Yes, I was just going it. to say this. Yes, yes. That's how we know this isn't a mass. Is yes, that we that's haven't how we know this isn't a mass. Yes. We haven't agreed on some abstraction, even, you yeah. know, if we were going to, right? The group of mm -hmm. people that we are now mutually in contact with have mm -hmm. resonated with mass formation as an idea, and we have seen mm -hmm. it move around. So if there was an idea that we were all going to sign on to and not notice, you know, that there was an incompleteness here or a paradox there, that would be it. But you're right, we're not doing that. And that is, uh, maybe that's the, uh, the check that we need to know that we are not in a mass is, are we holding each other's feet to the fire or not? Right. And I don't want to be part of any uh, mm -hmm. group that isn't willing to honorably hold each other's feet to the fire. For one thing, that's how we make sense. That's the whole point of the endeavor, right? Mm -hmm. We will, we, you know, we will freeze ourselves in place with a narrative that isn't true if mm -hmm. we don't uh, pressure test it and uh, challenge each other. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Yes. But I think suddenly it seems to me to be a very attractive idea or, or a very attractive question. Like indeed, on the one hand, we could say that from a rational point of view, the smartest choice is to go along with the masses and to feel protected by the masses. Uh, on the other hand, we could also say, no, it's the other way around. It's better to belong to the small group because if you do the right thing as a small group, if you stick to your ethical principles, you will go through this fast process of evolution, which has been described by many people, and which maybe is the is the real destiny of the human being, to become an ethically aware human being, uh, with an enlightened mind, um, and yeah, perfect. Um, yeah. And you know, I keep trying to explain to people who, you know, as I'm sure happens with you, people will come up and they will say, "You're very brave. I admire you." This, that, and the other. I try to explain this situation left no choice. I literally do not know how I would have done the other thing, right? I wouldn't have been able to stand it for five minutes. And, and so it is that which, you know, does, you know, it does rob it of a certain amount of courage. I didn't have a choice. I didn't make the choice to do this. It just simply was the only thing um, that, that was tolerable. But it does raise this other question. One of the things I saw, so I saw two mass formations in a row, right? There's the mass formation uh, around woke ideology, mm -hmm. which did the same thing. It created a group of people who uh, came together from very different perspectives, uh, battled the irrationality of the claims. Um, mm -hmm. And it was, it was a, a wonderful chapter. Mm -hmm. Then when COVID came, 
it shocked me because it took the group of people who had uh, formed this anti-mass to the woke ideology and it divided it. Some of the people who um, saw right through the woke ideology fell right in line with the, uh, I mean, I call it, uh, I call them medically woke, right? It's mm -hmm. equally irrational. And yet, mm -hmm. and they've demonstrated the capacity to see through irrational things and the courage to do it. And yet in this case, something about this story was in their blind spot. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't understand it. Um, maybe, maybe you do. Why is it that people who have resistance to this in one context don't have resistance in another? Yes, I think that the, 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 the emergence of the woke culture in our society was like a preparatory phase for the large mass formations that still have to come. Because um, um, in my opinion, the corona crisis was the first real mass formation, because, exactly because it has this baffling characteristic that it split all the existing groups in two. That's, the, that's the, the, the signature of a real mass formation. It is energetically so strong that it redivides, reorganizes the entire social structure. Um, but the, yes, and, 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 and once, once a, one real mass formation emerged in society, very often a second one and a third one and a fourth one follows just because the mass formation recreates, uh, recreates the conditions that made it emerge. Mass formation started uh, on the basis of loneliness and disconnectedness, but the mass formation itself leads to even much more disconnectedness and loneliness. While it seems to do the opposite in the beginning, it destroys the social bond further. And after a mass formation, there is even more lonely people, more disconnected people, which very often makes that a, a second mass formation and a third one emerges so shortly after the first one uh, uh, ceased to ex or, or, or disappeared a little bit in the background. So um, um, I believe that uh, the, the, the phenomenon is very well known. If a real mass formation emerges, then something happens, something, something very specific, specific happens in, in certain people, which is referred to as a mental surrender. People who were convinced uh, uh, anti-totalitarians or anti-fascists or no matter what, very often suddenly become fascists themselves as soon as a fascist mass formation emerges just because mm -hmm. they don't have the they don't have the mental energy or the psychological strength to to prevent that or the all the energy is sucked away from their mental representations and invested in the mental and only this limited set of mental representations that is shared by the group so and, and many people I, I know personally many people who wrote articles many people i knew i know a, a, a few people who wrote articles about the dangers of technocratic totalitarianism about uh, uh, the, the the danger of the dangers of extreme collectivism and conformism and then the corona crisis started and in the blink of an eye they conformed to the mainstream narrative and they declared everyone crazy who didn't go along with the mainstream narrative so uh, that's that's the strange thing <laughs> and in my in in, in my case, exactly the, well, not the opposite happened, but something different happens. I had exactly the same experience as the one that you described. And I, I, I talked about it in numerous podcasts before this one, that in the beginning of the crisis, I realized immediately, I will speak out. I have no other option. And I will continue speaking out, no matter what it, 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 it brings to me, or no matter what the consequences are. I just immediately knew if I don't speak out now, I will never have to speak out and I will do it. I will just do it. And I started to speak almost without, uh, I didn't have the feeling that I chose for it. I knew it. I will speak out. <laughs> right. Uh, in my case, I would say I had had that discussion with myself decades ago, right? I think in part, in my case, growing up as a Jew, as close to the end of World War II as I did. I was born in 1969, so a quarter century later, but nonetheless, close enough that it was on people's minds. Many people I knew had seen it. Mm. Um, and my basic feeling was, I looked at all of the people who waited too long to speak out, who did something that leaves me frustrated even hearing what their response was. And my thought was, uh, there, I will not, I will not go along with such a thing. 
right? Even, even at the cost of my life, I would much rather take mm -hmm. my best shot and mm -hmm. not be left with the question of why didn't I do more mm -hmm. than uh, to be stuck. And so anyway, at the point that you get to the thing, you know, the choice was just made. Yes, it's in my case, yeah, yeah. In my, as well, I think, because my family also has this, well, tradition of speaking out, no matter what the cost is. C certain people in my, in my ancestors did that. And um, I also think that I also, I, like when I started to work at university, uh, I, and, I, and I saw how, how, how many flawed research there was, I immediately started to reveal it. And I, start, I, 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 I tried to show what the problems were with this kind of research. And after, after two years at university, 90% of the people was very angry with me and the other 10% really respected me. Uh -huh. And, and I, I, I had this also there, I, 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 in, in that period, throughout the last 20 years, I really became used to having 90% of the people against me and trying to continue to speak out in a very quiet way without trying to hurt anyone and uh, being respectful to as much as possible. But still, I always refused to shut up. And when the Corona crisis started, I knew like, look, this time I will speak in public space. Um, uh, I used to speak out in, in only in the academic world, but I knew like this one, I will speak out in public space. And I don't know if that was also something that you experienced, but while I continued to speak out, people were throwing mud at me here in the Belgian newspapers. It happens all the time, even now. It, it constantly, uh, the, 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 yeah, there are, if, if the mainstream media um, talk about me, it's always in a very negative and condescending way. And um, but as I practiced and as I, and as I as I try to continue to speak out without really becoming aggressive myself or without uh, just calm and quiet, I really had this feeling that I felt as if a, a very warm and soft power grew stronger in me. And, uh, you know, this experience in itself, for me, compensates for everything that I have lost in the crisis, which is not so much. I have been excommunicated from certain groups at university. Um, I won't be too dramatic about it, uh, and but 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 still, no matter what I would lose, I would want to uh, give it. Uh, if I have this phenomenon in return, that you feel the soft power that is increasing in myself, and that that for me is the is the essence of life. Actually, um, I, I agree, and I uh, I wish I knew how to convey what you're describing to a larger audience. I, I will say it's very interesting to hear um, that you have polarized the institutions you've been part of. I've had that same phenomenon. I've polarized every institution I've been a part of. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when people who don't, who haven't had that experience hear it, they think, what, how terrible that you're polarizing. And the answer is, mm -hmm. no, I want the respect of the people that I think their respect means something. Right. If you mm -hmm. polarize an institution and all of the people who are, uh, you know, phonies or corrupt or cowards, if they all, you know, line up against you and the people that you actually admire are like ready to acknowledge, yeah, you, you make sense, then the, the answer is, well, what else would you have done? Do you want the respect of people who aren't respectable? I don't. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the, yes, the, um, what you are describing, what I think I have also experienced is a training program for something. It's a developmental experience that generates mm -hmm. certain characteristics that if you have them, mm -hmm. you're not eager to trade them for something else, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, I feel the same way in some sense about, uh, you know, I have what people describe as dyslexia. It mm -hmm interfered with my ability to do normal schoolwork. But I don't look at it as something that I lost. I looked at it as something that forced me into patterns that I uh, uh, wouldn't know what to do without. And so um, anyway, I, yeah, the, the path of somebody who polarizes institutions is not necessarily fun hour to hour, but uh, viewed on a long time scale, it does it's very clarifying and um, 
I wish more people realized that and didn't fear uh, causing people to reject them. Mm. Yes, 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 I agree. I agree. There is something, there is this, um, uh, in the Talmud says, if I'm not mistaken, if a human being uh, does not speak, does not articulate the words that emerge in him or herself, and that seem to be honest and sincere words, then he will slowly start to lose his soul. And I do believe the opposite is true as well. If you practice and if you con constantly try to articulate the words that you consider to be sincere and honest words, no matter what the consequences are and no matter how the group reacts to it, then you will st slowly start to be more aware of your own existence as a human being. You will start to feel stronger. You will feel your real identity. You will uh, be less in need of all kinds of ego and, and, and um, fake identities. And I think for me, the human being uh, is intrinsically dependent on the quality of his speech. I think that the speech, the quality of our speech, and then I don't mean the aesthetical qualities, but the, the, level, the, the sincerity and, uh, of, of speech and the courage uh, uh, of your words um, determines in a straightforward way uh, the strength of your soul and the strength of your mind, I think. And I think the better we realize that, the more we know that maybe we should tolerate that they take everything away of us in the end. Uh, but we should make sure that they don't take away our humanity. And, and, and that we, if, we, if we have to die that, we die, that we die with our principles and not without. Um, uh, that's something that I, well, I became more, much more aware of during this crisis. Like, like, like what is important and what is not important uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in this life here. Um, yeah, I, I think that's uh, beautifully said. And uh, at the risk of tarnishing it, I will put it in uh, what I take to be the evolutionary context. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people are often prone to, you know, ask, well, what's really special about humans, right? And they come up with all kinds of uh, things, but really in the end, it is speech. And the reason that it is speech is because that allows two minds to share ideas, abstract ideas. And this is the core of what we do that other creatures cannot, right? Indeed, I agree. Um, so anyway, in, in saying the quality of your speech and the, uh, the integrity of it, and uh, I would argue the capacity of it to convey uh, important nuance, um, you're really talking about the thing about us that uh, unites the individual with something else, right? Speech, yes, you can talk to yourself, and you know, I think a lot of us who care about speech probably do, but, um, but the point is, to say that your speech is important is to imply that your relationship, the integrity of your relationship and your capacity mm -hmm. to interact with somebody in a deep, high bandwidth fashion is also at the core of, you know, the most meaningful element of being human. And I 100% agree with that. Um, yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. And the, I think that our relationship, the social bond between humans is always intrinsically linguistic in nature. Because we, can't, we, we have no other option than to constantly try to interpret the other. The expressions on the face, uh, everything is interpreted by us. We have no other option. We constantly do. And so it's, 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 it's indeed, we, we are linguistic entities for each other. <laughs> and, the, and we can only connect and to each other through language. Or, uh, or our, the nature of our, of our connection is, is linguistic. Um, intrinsically, um, uh, yes, I think it, you know, the, the art of speech um, is the answer, I think, to all totalitarianism. Yes. Now, Heather and I many times have uh, discussed the fact that modernity has taken many essential human functions and it has shifted them to the market 
Mm. Right. Whereas mm. a person 200 or 300 years ago would have had many close contacts. They probably would have known many of them for their whole life. Um, they would have had a life partner. Um, they would have produced children almost automatically. Those relationships would have been very important to them. All of those things would be true. Now, children are very optional. Partners are increasingly optional. And as the pandemic set in, it dawned on us that people trapped without even a single person that they could look in the eye and say, is this making sense to you? Because I hear everybody saying nonsense and I don't know what to make of it. If you didn't have one person that you could trust to say, yeah, I see it too, you were in grave danger of not making any sense at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wonder if that's part of what happened is that lots of people who didn't have partners because you don't absolutely need one um, got isolated in a way that maybe is almost without precedent. No, of course, it is. It is all like uh, Stalin isolated his population because he knew that they were much more vulnerable for propaganda. Then he intentionally did isolate his population because he knew that they were that it was much easier to to use propaganda in that case. Uh, Hitler didn't, but but the 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 effect was it was 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 the same actually as mass formation exists. It all it also spontaneously creates isolation and and uh, and a certain loneliness. But here in this case, with the, with the corona crisis, we have never seen such an extreme state of isolation of the population. Never, I think. And at the same time, people were constantly uh, bombarded with these messages, with, the, with, the, with, 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 with propaganda through their iPhones, through their through television, through radio, constantly. So it was the most extreme example uh, of, of, a, of, a, of an optimal situation to use propaganda. So a couple of things I want to make sure we, we highlight here. One is your point about one mass formation often follows another. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you about this because what I've seen, and I almost wonder if there's not an addiction where mm -hmm. because people feel isolated, and I will argue in a moment that that is the most, because our ancestors were starving and because no human is equipped to, to survive alone in the world, being isolated is a terrifying experience because it's huh. basically a precursor to starving to death. Mm -hmm. um, so when people feel that isolation, either because it's induced by somebody who wants to control them or because it's a natural consequence of technologies and economic systems that separate us, they have this desire to replace something that they've lost. They don't mm. know, necessarily know what it is, but when it is offered in the form of sign up for this narrative and you suddenly become part of this large enthusiastic group, right? We're going to be the winners. We're going to end up with the food. And mm. all you got to do is believe these things and say them and punish the right people. And you can be one of us, mm. right? That satisfies. It relieves the pressure of the threat. Right. And then the mm -hmm. point is, at some point, coronavirus stops being a compelling narrative or the slate of beliefs is so far off the evidence. And podcasts are so full of people talking about, you know, the hazards that you may have exposed yourself to if you believed these things that people don't they're not enthusiastic about it anymore. And so then the point is, well, they're still looking for something that causes them to feel safe and together mm -hmm. with people. And so they're, they're primed for some other topic. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I almost, I, I watched um, Trump as this uniting force, right? We have to do away with this demon become mm -hmm. the public health narrative, right? They're obviously almost unrelated topics. Mm -hmm. And yet people went seamlessly from one to the other because it was, they were on the same team and they had become addicted to that team. And, um, you know, I, I do wonder where we are now, uh, obviously. Yes, you also, you, it, it was also remarkable, I think, that as soon as the corona narrative disappeared a little bit in the background, uh, we, 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 the Ukraine, the, the yep. narrative on the war in Ukraine, 
seem to fulfill a little bit the same function. There was again this tendency to consider the good and the bad uh, very much in black and white. And then also there was like a new object of anxiety and a new uh, uh, intolerance for dissonant voices. Uh, also this new enthusiasm, this new solidarity. Um, yes, I also think like at the moment now, it seems that mass formation became a little bit milder, miti mitigated a little bit. But I don't think we are rid of. We, so we see that the consequences of, of the of the mass formation are very very severe at the psychological level. Like I don't know how it is in the United States, but I think it is the same. But now that students are allowed to come back to university to follow courses on campus, they don't show up anymore. Only five percent shows up. The same holds for the professors and the assistants at university. The, the buildings are empty. Uh, in in companies, I hear the same story. And. Uh, the, the, the cultural sector, the theaters and the, and the movies, nobody shows up. So that shows us something very specific, namely that the mass formation was extremely destructive at the level of the social bond. And that, you know, the social bond, people always at the same time find their deepest satisfaction in the social bond, but they also have to overcome a certain resistance to take a step to the other because of all kinds of things, shame, anxiety, uncertainty, self-awareness, and so on. And so if, if, if the energetic, the psychological energy invested in the social bond goes below a certain threshold, then you typically see that people prefer to stay home. And that's what they do now. That's what they do now. Many people stay home or many people don't go back to work, don't go back to university. Um, and this probably, will prepare them for an even more, more intense example of mass formation in the nearby future. Unless, again, and that's so important, the dissonant voices really do their best, continue to speak out. And that's that's I, I'm, I'm confident that there is a group of people who is very determined now that they won't remain silent and that they will speak out. So I'm also, I'm confident that in the, in the, year, the years to come probably will be, bit, will be very difficult years. But the group who uh, uh, defies the masses and, and refuses to buy into the, the mainstream narrative will be large and, and determined enough, I think, to keep open a certain path, no matter how difficult it is, uh, so that uh, the totalitarian system cannot destroy everything. Um, well, we have to figure out how to retain our ability to speak to the world. I think the, the people who have emerged globally, it's a mm. very powerful group of people and i think we you know we are we are well positioned to speak mm -hmm. um to speak carefully about what's unfolding and i agree that what is what is to come may be well worse than what we've already um mm -hmm. seen i will say to your point about uh people not going back to university uh to their jobs etc we've seen some of that in the us i think it's not quite the same but I will say, having had the opportunity after two years of really not straying very far from home, I have now traveled a couple of times, uh, a little bit around the U.S., uh, a little bit to Britain, and I am struck by, I, it's very hard for me to explain, and I want to be very cautious because it's possible that it's in my mind and I'm not actually seeing what's in the world, but I feel a kind of unease in the population that people have gone back to activities that they remember, they're taking pleasure in being mm. in the sun, things like this. But there is this sense, and I definitely have it, that I have now watched um, a spasm of what took place uh, in Russia before the formation of the Soviet Union, what took place in Germany uh, before the Nazis. I have seen that begin to happen and I am aware of what it implies. And in some ways, the most difficult question for me is if this relaxes, how is it that, <clears throat> that we go back to living with each other I mean, for one thing, once you've seen it happen and you know, well, this is the confirmation of what many of us have said, which is it can happen here, right? It can happen across the West. Mm -hmm. um, so the, that means that it must be an extremely high priority that we figure out what makes it happen, 
that we figure out how to get in the way and that we figure out how to rescue people that we know from it as it's happening so that it doesn't take them over. Right. But I don't know how to do that. No, and, no, no. and I wonder if everybody is sort of feeling this tension of now having watched us divide into these teams that yes, could turn into something genocidal. It didn't in this case yet, mm. at least. Um, mm. What do we do with that knowledge? Uh, that's a good question. That's a good question, of course. And I think that, well, as fast as possible, we should try to talk with each other again. Also, people who found themselves in a different camp, <laughs> who the people who. So we have to have to restart the dialogue and 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 the, and the the dialectical process between each other. Uh, that's one thing. But I think that at the same time, I'm convinced that the problem of the emerging mass formation and totalitarianism uh, can never be really solved as long as we stick to our reductionist, mechanist view on man and the world. Because the, the, the root cause and the ultimate cause of, of the phenomenon of totalitarianism, I agree with Hannah Arendt in that respect, definitely, that it is to be situated in, a, in, in the mechanist, materialist ideology, not mechanist science, because science has nothing to do with it, actually. But it is a scientific ideology. When science turns into an ideology, that means science wants was an answer to dogmatic and, and, and institutionalized religion, but slowly it became an ideology itself. It became a set of dogmas and a set of uh, pre prejudices itself, and, uh, and, and a, a very specific ideology, an ideology which believed that the entire universe could be reduced to a materialist machine uh, and, and perfectly described in a rationalist way, perfectly manipulated and controlled in a rational way. And that rational understanding should be the basis, the cornerstone of human living together. I disagree with that. I really disagree. I disagree in this respect that the rational knowledge uh, is very important. And the process we have been going through as a society throughout the last few hundred years is very important, but only if it leads to the next step I, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of René Tom, one of the famous mathematicians of the 20th century and one of the founders of systems theory. And he said, ultimately, he said, this part of reality that can be understood in a rational way is rather limited. And the rest of reality, you can only know by empathically resonating with it. And, and, and that, that, for me, it took me until I was 35 years old when I became familiar with the, with the mathematical basis of systems theory, to suddenly start to understand, and it was a true revelation for me, that um, our rational understanding was never capable of grasping the true essence of life around us, and that we needed a different way of knowing the world. And René Tom uh, uh, uses the word resonating knowledge um, to feel or to be connected with the essence of the world around us. Also, Niels Bohr also had this wonderful statement. He said, when it comes to atoms, language can only be used as poetry. You, can't, you, you, you can only use language as poetry when you want to grasp something of the strange irrational behavior, ultimately, of, 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 uh, of, uh, of uh, elementary particles. And it, it also makes me think of several statement of several uh, um, principles in the samurai culture in Japan, where they said that in every art, when you master an art or a craft or something, there is first a stage, this rational stage, in which you learn certain rules, in which you learn so certain techniques that you can understand in a rational way and, you and that you have to learn in a rational way. But the real, the, the goal of the, of, of the learning process is not the techniques in itself, the goal of, the, of this rational stage of, of, of the learning process is always to be, come in touch with something, to start to develop a certain feeling, a certain feeling that you can never, never articulate perfectly in a rational way, but which is the real goal of the, of the learning process. And the samurai said, it's one thing to learn a technique, but it's more difficult to forget it again. And if you don't succeed in forgetting it, before you go to the battlefield, they said, you will die on the battlefield. So you need this other type of knowledge, which is more a resonating knowledge, which is also a kind of knowledge, which really gives a certain touch, a certain feeling of connection with, uh, with what is out there. 
and which makes you aware, I think, of the eternal principles of, 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 of the real outside of you, the eternal principles of the mystery of all life around you. And it are these principles, I think, these principles, which are like the principles of humanity, the principles of nature, the, princ the ethical principles, um, it are these principles that should be the real cornerstone of human living together and not rational knowledge that no matter how important rational knowledge is, is always temporary. It's always, tem it, it's always, it will always be renewed. It will always, I mean, the real, the only thing that can organize a fruitful living together, I think, is principles and not rational knowledge. Well, um, that is the basis of several conversations we might have. I have a whole different taxonomy that I have a feeling results in the same conclusion, right? Mm -hmm. My sense is uh, the universe can in principle be understood mechanistically. We are a million miles from the ability to do it on the topics that matter most, right? Mm -hmm. We are in our infancy with respect to understanding biology and psychology and society. Um, so at some level, we are stuck in the predicament that you are describing, not because the world isn't mechanistic, but because mm -hmm. the mechanisms are so complex that we don't even have the tooling to investigate them yet, right? I mean, if we look at Mandelbrot's, um, you know, uh, investigation of fractals as a solution to um, the, bio, the math of biology, basically, right? We needed a different kind of math to even begin to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. And I think we are in the same place. Our science is much better with simple phenomena than it is with complex phenomena because that's where we learn to do it. Mm -hmm. But I 100% resonate with the idea that the whole goal of the exercise of learning things in a conscious way is to stop doing them consciously. That's when you really get good at something. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, um, so we have to think that way. And the other thing I would add, <clears throat> which I heard implied in what you said, is that a mechanistic understanding, even if you had it, even if you had the complete mechanistic picture of the universe, it would not deal with the values issue. You could reverse engineer why we hold the values that we do. But the fact is, we have to, at some level, um, stop trying to justify the values on the basis of the mechanism. It doesn't mm -hmm. work, right? And we have to say something like, um, it is glorious to be alive on this planet. And if mm -hmm. that is true, we are obligated to deliver that experience to people in the future, to not deny it to them by destroying what we have, right? That is an ethical obligation. Um, mm -hmm. And if you become too mechanistic, you'll say something like, well, it's all going to be destroyed anyway. There's nothing we can do about it, right? Mm -hmm. The earth will be destroyed. The galaxy will be destroyed. Ultimately, the universe will be destroyed. So it's all for naught. Why are we obligated to, you know, to defend what we've got? And the answer is you just failed the ethical test. You may have passed the mechanistic one, but you failed the ethical one. Mm -hmm. You got the values wrong. So um, in any case, yeah, it's... Uh, and what you said at the beginning particularly resonates, right? What you said is that this, um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it was words to the effect of that science has become not only a mechanism for studying things, but it's become an ideology. Is that what you said? Yes, yes. I, did. I, I agree with this and not a sophisticated ideology either. It's become a very narrow-minded ideology and the, uh, the costumes of science have been taken to be a good indicator of who knows what they're talking about. And mm -hmm. it's nonsense as the Corona mm -hmm. pandemic demonstrated just so extremely. Mm -hmm. oh, indeed. Indeed. Yes. And that's a strange thing. When people blind believe, blindly believe in rationality, they end up being radically irrational. That's a strange, that's, that's one of the strange things. When you make science into an ideology, you often believe that you, um, uh, these people who make science into an ideology often believe that they are extremely rational, but in the end, they become radically irrational. That's something very strange. Um, but as you, as you said, um, well, the question as to what extent reality is mechanistic in nature is a very important one. And I think that in the end, we might have a very fruitful disagreement, I believe, but that depends 
It depends, of course, whether you how you define uh, 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 mechanistic, the, the the word mechanistic, because yeah, what does that mean? The word mechanistic. Uh, I, I yeah, do you mean that everything can be reduced to the elementary laws of of of, uh, of mechanics, uh, the mechanical laws of Newton? Um, how 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 do we define that? It's 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 not easy to define it. Or for instance, the mechanisms of language. I I I'm, I'm well. As soon as you, if you study uh, material reality, uh, at least that's what uh, the physicists of the 20th century concluded, then you soon uh, have to conclude that subjective experience and all kinds of psychological phenomena have a certain impact. On mechanistic, on 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 the on on the behavior of of the material elementary particles, and that for me seems to be an indication that we actually can never succeed in reducing everything to the laws of mechanics. But they can be wrong. I can be wrong. Well, but... I would say we want to we want to parse this very carefully. Mm -hmm. The my argument would be as far as we know, everything could be reduced up till the point we get to Heisenberg uncertainty. And then the question is, is Heisenberg uncertainty an observational problem or is it built into the structure of the universe? I believe it actually has to be built in. There has to be uncertainty mm -hmm. at the ground level. Mm -hmm. But short of that, I would argue that in principle, the universe appears to be comprehensible mechanistically, but in practice, it never will be. Right. Mm. In other words, the um, the computational power. It is not the correct way to think about the universe. That you could, in principle, you know, you could, in principle, understand a baseball game at the level of the molecules. But mm. it's not a good way to understand a baseball game. No. Right? It, no. It's too it cumbersome. Is. Yeah. And also, the the organizing principle has to be situated. I think at the level of the intentions. Of, of the of the players involved I believe but but and also like well you know what's definitely certain is that the universe will always be unpredictable that's something that was very clearly shown by complex dynamical systems theory that even uh, that every complex dynamical system even if you know the formulas the mathematical formulas that determine the system, then still it will be unpredictable simply because of the, char the, char the characteristic of uh, sensitivity for initial conditions in a in complex dynamical system. It will remain forever unpredictable um, because differences in the state of the system that are infinitely small can create a radically different behavior in the system, meaning that you can never measure precise enough to predict how the system will behave. So the universe is definitely unpredictable. So uh, the idea of uh, Laplace that one time there could be a computational force that is strong enough to predict the entire future is uh, rejected. Um, uh, but if that means that, uh, that the universe behaves in an irrational way, that's another question. And I'm inclined to believe that it does actually. I'm inclined to believe that it does behave in an irrational way. Well, yeah, I, I think this is a, a potentially productive disagreement, uh, maybe for another time. But yes. uh, yeah, there, there is a question about why those systems are, you know, is all of that unpredictability the result? Is it cascading from uncertainty at a very fine grained level? I, I believe that it is. I'm not wedded to that position, but I believe that it is. And I believe we don't have a fully deterministic universe, but we do have a mechanistic universe. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the difference that I'm arguing. A deterministic universe to me would make no sense. I mean, for one thing, it would invalidate the meaning that we take from evolutionary dynamics completely. Mm -hmm. If all of those dynamics were set in stone from the moment the universe began, that's a very different phenomenon than uh, an environment in which you have creatures competing over limited resources, which implies that one could win or another one could win and then one does, right? Um, but anyway, this becomes a very uh, yes. intractable philosophical conversation very quickly. Indeed, yes. 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 Well, well. 
Um, yeah. Is there anything more you want to say uh, as we wrap up? Uh, no, not really. We have been talking about a lot and, uh, and I liked it very much. Uh, I want to thank you very much for inviting me uh, and for bringing my book to the attention of the people. Uh, yeah, do you uh, have a copy? I do not have a copy or I would hold it up. Do you have a copy? Somewhere? I will. I will send. No, I don't. I, I, I no. I gave right. my I gave my copy to to Eric Clapton actually. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> and, and now I will uh, I will receive ten new copies, <laughs> but but I don't have one here now. Nice. But uh, I will I will have you send one, Brett. Oh, great, great, excellent. Well, I look forward to it. Um, I will say this was a great conversation, um, and I feel that I have encountered a a kindred spirit and a fellow polarizer of institutions. And, you know, that's got to be that's got to be good. So this has been extremely enjoyable. I hope people who have uh, watched and or listened have also found it interesting. I know everyone will have found it challenging, as I did. Um, but in any case, I hope we uh, we meet in person soon. Oh, me too. Likewise. I hope I do. Oh, one more thing. Where do people find you? Yeah, that's a good question. I only have a Facebook page and a LinkedIn page, but now I will start a Substack um, uh, uh, in, in one or two weeks. Very good. Uh, but uh, at this moment, it's yeah, maybe on Facebook, but it's it's uh, yeah, you can find me on Facebook or on LinkedIn. Uh, but I will go on Substack uh, in the nearby future. You're you're um, one of very few people who are uh, in this milieu who are not on Twitter, but not because anyone threw you off, or were you thrown off? No, 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 no. Well, I never, I never tried to go on Twitter. And then uh, before the Corona crisis, I, I, I almost didn't know that there was that there was such a thing like social media. <laughs> but then, then now, now I start, now I start to be aware of it. <laughs> yes. Well, I think in in your business of studying mass formation, yeah. you need to you need to be yeah, yeah, aware yeah. of of social media. Uh, all right. And the name of your book? Uh, the psychology of totalitarianism. Psychology yes. of Totalitarianism, which is, of course, uh, a derivation of Hannah Arendt's earlier title, which was... Uh, the origins of Totalitarianism. The origins yeah. of Totalitarianism. All it's right, a excellent. mixture between the origins of Totalitarianism and the psychology of the crowd of Gustave Le Bon. Wow, uh, very good. No. Got it. All right. Well, people should, people should pick it up and uh, read it, and then hopefully we can avert the disaster that otherwise might be headed our way. We will. We All will. right. Well, Professor, thanks very much. Thank you, Brett. Thank you very much for inviting me. Be well.